Okay, let's do a bit of Titan work. Osamia, so new type research accelerated. Our mobile suit options will go with the Goblin, because the Psycho Gundam Mark II, while less than a death trap than its predecessor, is still a death trap. And we can bust out the bomb dock later in the campaign. This is more Goplant territory. Rosamia unit launching. I don't see Rosamia and Four getting along. I found you, Amy. Granted, with four floating around the Psycho Gundam, it might have been a more appropriate for me to bring the Psycho Gundam Mark II, but I'm not i am not making my life harder by flying around in an actual death trap. Circle strafing is my tr- um, Fayuiri in a memo. Okay. That little trip just cost you your escape. Don't get away. Yes. I can transform and you can, Camille. Come on! You son of a bitch! Dying of fire! Almost had him! Thanks for the help, Four! God, the Psycho Gundams are useless in this game. Oh sure, they look imposing, a Gundam like five times the scale of a normal Gundam. But they don't, they don't behave remotely imposing. Planning on shooting at some point? You're not getting away. I won't let you bring the sky down. <laughs> Nemo looks like it's checking out the Psycho Gundam's ass! Oh. Great, great. I'm just getting flashbacks of back when, like, Ari Village came out and everybody was just obsessed over Al Dimitrescu. Everybody just wanted their fucking vampire dommy mommy. I mean, of course, it helped that uh, people were on lockdown, so naturally that's going to make everybody a lot hornier. Where's the enemy? Oh. I did it. Campfire straight down beyond mobile suit. Oh, this is post the shuttles escaping.
This is ugly. You know, it kind of concerns me that a lot of the talk now about, like, space flight, especially manned space flight, it's all going to be, like, privately funded, corporatized, luxury space flight and that kind of shit. And the thing is, it's, it's not like it's, uh, you know, brave new frontiers. We've been in orbit before plenty of times. We went to the damn moon. I mean, we should be pushing the boundaries, starting to build colonies on, on planetoids or just in orbit, going to other worlds, going to Mars. I'm going to Europa. I'm going to Titan. Go somewhere, anywhere. Explore. Do a thing. Build some infrastructure. Make some interstellar gas stations. I mean, the issue for me, of course, is that we have kind of an unobtainium type of situation. Because fusion I'm power. I know I've brought this up before. Fusion power. It's so desirable because in order for us to advance, we need atomics. But fission energy is dirty. It's a PR nightmare because of, you know, the bomb. The whole business. Oh, this is another one where I can theoretically get a 100% hit rate. I think the bomb dock might be better for that. I'll kill anyone who wants to make the sky fall. This probably won't work because I can't just, like, park inside of a dome and have the enemy not even be able to... We'll see what happens. Okay, so, no. Fusion. Because mm -hmm. the, the no thing is... The detractors can't exactly argue that fusion is impossible, because we have devices called fusers that actually fuse things into other things. It's not even, like, remotely something that we can't do. It's just that, as it stands right now, that process nets an, a loss of energy, which is not great. That's the whole issue. What we're trying to do is create usable power from a source of fusion energy. And our existing studies represent a huge hurdle in terms of upfront investment as a big issue, a big hurdle to overcome. That's not good. Oh, but he's on this side. This is ugly. Well, if I fire the Rick Diaz only in the direction of the Arumula, I don't risk missing my target. And there goes the S-Rank. I... that's the first time I think I've seen those things fire in this LP. I was starting to think they were just cosmetic. And now it's actually going to be a garbage ring, because I have been fired at so few times that, that, that because it's determined based on a percentage, that's going to put me down to like an evade rate of, of like 0%. Yeah, right now, to create fusion that nets a profitable amount of energy, we need reactors Bigger than cities, like huge Takamak reactors. And as you can imagine, those aren't cheap. Oh, it's a nut. Well, oh, the head Vulcan, right. Well, it wasn't an S rank, though. So, yeah, we need these massive reactors, and they're not cheap. They're not. They are hilariously expensive. I'll use the Ashamar just for something different. I'll kill anyone who wants to make the sky fall. And here's the thing, though. This fusion Here's power does produce radioactive byproducts in the form of both ionizing right, and Don't neutron radiation. But unlike fission reactors, it doesn't, like, just passively spew these things. Furthermore, it doesn't react without all the complex infrastructure necessary to make the reaction possible. So, at most, if you were to lose containment on a fusion reactor, there would be an explosion, but it would be more like a boiler explosion. Now, granted, that's kind of what happens in a fission reactor as well, 
the key difference is in a fission reactor, you then have all this radioactive material that keeps fizzling on its own and being a hazard to the locals for a very, very long time. You know, Chernobyl being perhaps the most prominent example of this. But you don't get that with fusion, because the material that you use to fuse is not in and of itself radioactive. It's just... it just sort of exists. Now, the thing is, of course, atoms are disinclined towards the fusion agenda to such an extent that we have to place them under extraordinary going. circumstances to... Now, this might have destroyed White Base. I can literally maintain assault indefinitely because of how, how much DPS that does. Can I raise the assault level? Yeah, I can actually raise the assault level. So in a reactor, you need to get the material incredibly hot and under an extraordinary amount of pressure. And that's where most of the energy loss comes from, because maintaining the material at that temperature and pressure there is no physical substance that can that can do that. I mean, the pressure, yes, because obviously the force exerted by magnets on the plasma, the fusion plasma, is exerted in an equal and opposite form on the magnets themselves, but the heat is a bit of a problem. If the plasma in a fusion reactor just touches anything that isn't a gas, it will just instantly vaporize it. And the issue is these fusion reactors are putting out radiation. So, because free neutron radiation is harmful... I'll kill anyone who wants to make the sky fall. Because free neutron radiation is harmful um, to the magnets as well, like Where's it damages the mechanical systems, it's not just a biological hazard. You have to place the magnets outside the reactor's primary shielding. Now, that's an issue because, again, a magnetic field loses strength exponentially the further you get away from the magnet. So, the design of those magnets is actually very inefficient. The trouble is, the alternative is to put them in the reactor, where they erode and lose functionality from neutron erosion, and then you have a whole other problem. And whatever you might save on the power invested to create a reaction, you lose in the maintenance of these magnets. And this is where a neutronic fusion comes in, where you combine, like, helium-3 with, I think, lithium? Or... I know that you can get a neutronic fusion by combining helium-3 with itself. And the thing is, this is kind of like the fusion holy grail, because since less than, I think, like a hundredth of a percent of the energy of a helium-3, helium-3 reaction is neutron radiation, you don't need to worry about heavy shielding. And you could actually reasonably place the magnets in the reactor with the actual reactor mass, and because, of course, the magnets are going to be constraining the actual plasma, you don't have to worry about them being eroded by neutron radiation. So you can make a reactor much more efficient, and all of the power you get out of an aneutronic reaction is recoverable. Whereas some power in any other type of reaction, fusion reaction, is lost to the actual neutrons that escape, because you can't really harvest them as an energy source. So yes, the aneutronic reactor is like the holy grail of nuclear fusion power. The problem is that you pretty much need helium-3 for any of the proposed reaction cycles, and it's it's unobtainium. It's literally unobtainium. Because it's an unstable atom that after about a decade or so of existing, like the moment the atom is created through some other fusion process, 
it will decay into other atomic material. So, functionally, the only way Helium 3 is created by fusion, and then it has a 10-year shelf life, not exactly, but around a 10-year shelf life before it disappears forever. So where do you get it? You either need an existing fusion reactor that either functions both for profit, energy profit, and, and economic profit, that you can scalp Helium-3 from, or you need a reactor that runs at a loss that produces Helium-3 for profitable reactors. Or, or, if you're an idealist, or just a space nerd, you use the sun. Because they have proposed that we might find Helium-3 deposited by solar winds in moon rocks, or in the upper atmosphere of Jupiter, because Jupiter's magnetosphere, because of its core of metallic hydrogen, is gargantuan even relative to the scale of Jupiter itself. And the thing is, is that that magnetosphere catches a lot of those solar winds, and so the upper atmosphere of Jupiter might be filled with Helium-3. Granted, it is a lot farther away from us than the moon. It's also a harder planet to operate in altogether. Jupiter winds, uh, even in the upper atmosphere, exceed like ten times or whatever the fastest winds ever recorded on Earth. It's not a fun place to operate. But the thing is, there is another option. Because a while back, they proposed interstellar vessels that would gather both fusion fuel and propellant using, like, multi-kilometer-wide rams with magnetic fields, like magnetic rams. Uh, ram scoops, sort of like an intake on a jet engine mounted on the front of the spacecraft. And these wouldn't have to be particularly thick, because if they were, they'd be prohibitively heavy. They just need to be as big as possible. And the thing is, if both Jupiter and the Moon are getting Helium-3 from solar winds, why don't we just park a big-ass ram somewhere in Earth orbit and literally just funnel Helium-3 into it? I mean, depending on the output of the sun, it wouldn't, like, a single ram scoop would not be viable for, like, a fusion power industry, but we might be able to get enough together to prove that aneutronic fusion sort of can do everything the fusion promises and more. And then there would be more investment in stuff like lunar colonization or Jupiter helium-3 scavenging. We could finally make it happen. Because that's another thing, by making a fusion process more um, efficient, you can also make it smaller. Because right now, again, to create usable energy from a fusion reactor, these reactors have to be huge. City-sized. If you're thinking about, like, plunking a reactor on a spacecraft, that would have to be a very large spacecraft. But, Helium-3, a neutronic reaction, you could put that on a spacecraft, right? There's, not, there's nothing that would stop you from doing that. Because you could probably make it substantially smaller than uh, a typical fusion reaction. Like I said, a neutronic fusion is like the holy grail of fusion power, but it's powered by unobtainium, the substance that is basically next to impossible to get without a lot of, like, you know, really careful work. Because the thing is, once fusion power proves its viability, because it still hasn't, we haven't really produced, um, like, a power profit from fusion, and even more so, it's not enough to make a power profit. The, the power you create must be profitable enough to offset maintenance of the reactor itself. It has to be financially viable. So there's still these two hurdles to overcome, which are why people like fusion power just won't work, because it never has worked. The thing is, again, it, it certainly can work. To some extent it involves... I mean, there are theories that we could make better magnets, electromagnets, for self-confining reactors, which is still very much a scientific hypothetical. If we could find... Um, uh, it, it, I'm not too familiar with it, but it does relate to, like, superconductors and the sort of magnetic pinning or fixing that they create. 
Because that's the thing, self-confining plasma exists in things like Z-pinches and so forth, and they have used those for certain fusion experimentation. But it's always like a pulse-detonating fusion reaction where you basically create a controlled explosion rather than a, a constantly slowly burning reactor thing. And I do question the viability of those types of inertial confinement reactors as opposed to magnetic confinement. For sure, car engines run on a series of self-reproducing explosions. But at a fusion scale, again, for continuous power generation, you'd have to have these fusion explosions going off almost constantly, and you'd have to have enough of these reactors in multiplicative setups that there is a constant semi-regular flow of power between the entire rate, which again, huge reactor complex, giant facility, size of a city. I'm coming back now. I mean, that team a while back that was working on a magnetic mirror design, which a lot of the fusion experts said right off wasn't going to work, because the reason we don't do that anymore is because it never did work. And they were talking about putting the magnets, like I said, getting them closer to the reactant in order to make the system more efficient. Well, <laughs> that part at least was right. <laughs> but they quickly discovered... Okay, I need firepower for this one. Wasamia unit, launching! Like, they discovered that putting the magnets inside the unit did greatly enhance containment and, you know, the pressures and temperatures that were possible relative to the energy up front. But first of all, they still... They still greatly undersized their reactor. Like, it was too small to be viable for what it is. And the bigger issue, again, is that they're using a magnetic mirror style of reactor and they suffered massive energy losses at either end of the mirror. Which was entirely predicted, because again, that's why we don't use magnetic mirrors anymore. But the issue again, the big issue, was that sure, they achieved greater efficiency by using magnets inside the reactor that weren't separated by the primary shields, but they discovered that the erosion rate that they had calculated, the neutron erosion of those magnetic mirrors they definitely lowballed that because it, they eroded at like almost double the speed that they had predicted. What are you doing? What are you doing? And again, the viability of that reactor as an energy source is also dependent upon things like the financial viability. Sure, you can save on energy for creating fusion by moving the magnets inside, but you're going to be constantly tearing the reactor apart and having to replace the magnets. The old ones, I should point out, will be ionized, dangerously so, so that basically becomes a, like a nuclear hazard byproduct. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of wishful thinking going on there, like, hey, nobody's doing it like this. It's like, nobody's doing it like that anymore, because it was already tried and it didn't work. I mean... <laughs> You almost get the impression that these guys went into this not actually having read the broad history of fusion power. They just figured that we'll, like, throw a thing together and it'll it'll be great because nobody's doing this right now. No sense of the history of it. Reminds me of that ingenious power storage strategy that they had of, like, stacking concrete blocks with a bunch of cranes and then lowering the blocks to recoup power. And it's like, oh, but creation of concrete is environmentally unfriendly. Oh, well, we're going to use a form of concrete manufacture that isn't environmentally unfriendly. Yes, creating extremely brittle concrete that you're going to stack in massive towers in urban developments that could just collapse at a moment's notice and bring a huge crane network down along with it. Genius! And the point is, this particular type of power storage isn't new. It's just that we usually use water containers and water because, oh, if there's a, a leak or break in that, it's not nearly as disastrous. I won't let you bring the sky down. Yeah, you pump the water up to some high container, which is also useful as a water tower, I might add when you have a surplus of energy in the network, and then you let it drain out running a Coming turbine to generate power 
<laughs> I mean, you can it, because it's water, you can kill two birds with one stone. It can be like a, a water supply for a city. So why would you use Lego blocks of concrete and cranes? Or these types that claim that their ingenious solution to making train travel more economical is to use smaller, modular cars, completely neglecting the fact that our existing cars for trains are already fairly modular, and the whole purpose of sort of mass transit is to drive the price down by moving large quantities of bulk goods, not these little things that are going to require probably more time sorting at specialized stations, more infrastructure that'll have to be built. I'll kill anyone who wants to make this then, then actually on the track. And of course, you realize right off the bat that, okay, these people are either stupid to propose this. They don't understand how any of it works. They just had, they had something that would look good on like a flow chart or something. And... And they decided to roll with it. That's preoccupied, Camille. Or these guys are deliberately malicious in their essentially proposing products and things that basically will not work. Because, oh, well, the investors don't know anything about this because they're businessmen, not scientists or technicians. And apparently nobody cross-specializes anymore because that's a huge waste of time. Choose choose an area of specialization and stick with it, you know, like a modern human being. I throw it scratchy, I've been screaming so much. Because, yes, as... Quiet as I probably sound, and despite the amplification on my mic, I am actually shouting a little bit right now to, to be heard. Yeah, it's basically like, look, all we need to do is convince investors it'll work, and then we'll have their money, and then whether it works or not, we can always blame it on something or other for going wrong. Either the manufacturers of, of this didn't do their job right, and that's why it didn't work. Or the researchers who gave us our information. Because you also end up with this weird instance of middlemen, where it's like, this idea wasn't even theirs. Some brainiac came up with a thing, may or may not have patented it, and then sold it to somebody who then proceeds to try and sell it to larger investors. You know, middle, middling middlemen businessmen. One unlucky hit and I'm completely out of whack. I'm coming back now. Zero percent evasion rate. Wow. Okay, that happened. Well, you know, I was getting myself out there, seeing as we had to protect our allies. I'll kill anyone who wants to make the sky fall. I mean, if they give you a reinforcement gauge, losing one machine, even if it is a psycho gun, it won't usually do it. But uh, better to be as I efficient as possible. Waiting. Don't take foolish chances. Oh, and then somebody had the brains in in the third world to propose an underwater, like pressurized that a uh, trainway that would be supported by floats, fucking floats, and it was going to be like a, a transparent material. There is so much wrong with that. Where do I fucking start? Like, floats are fine for lightweight applications across very short distances where you're going to have rigid supports at either end and very little relative stress that threatens the structure. Furthermore, the structure itself is not, like, a critical component. Like, if it does break, so you lose your float bridge. You can always, like, get a launch out there and reattach it or fix it. But you're going to build a channel out of a transparent material 
that has to be capable of supporting an internal oxygen environment surrounded by seawater. And your brilliant way of supporting this <coughs> is by basically just floats on the surface of the water. What happens when there are strong currents? This is my first point. What happens when there are strong currents? I mean, especially transparent material. When you're talking transparent material, you're usually talking about brittle and heavy. Or lightweight, but extremely fragile. Like, saran wrap is transparent, but I certainly wouldn't want to build a submarine out of it. Glass, on the other hand, is... <laughs> or no, saran wrap is light, not heavy. I said saran wrap is heavy. Saran wrap is light, but I certainly want to want to build a submarine out of it. And glass is heavy. <laughs> and I know there's, like, plastics and polycarbonates and stuff they have now, but even so... The bigger problem is not just the fact that they're building this underwater railway, which has to support the weight of a fucking train. So it's not even just an issue of the weight of the infrastructure itself, it's what it has to support. And the velocity of what it has to support is going to be moving. It's going to be supporting the train, and it's going to be doing it with floats, which is another problem. Track that has train on it and track that doesn't have train on it are going to be vastly different weights. How are the floats going to maintain their position? If the whole thing droops and sags as the train passes through it, then it's going to fucking... Like I said, there's so many levels of dumb, but yet investors have invested millions of dollars into the development of this project and it's not going to go anywhere. Because the moment you put an actual scientific mind behind it, they're going to tell you you're out of your goddamn mind. And furthermore, let's say the track fails. It'll start to flood. When it floods, it'll sink. Which means that you could have a tiny breach that compromises one section of track crossing this ocean or lake or whatever in the hell they're trying to get this track across. It floods that section. That section stinks putting strain on the flotation devices for the rest of the track, and then the whole, all the infrastructure, the entire investment, bottom of the body of water. Oh my god. I'll kill anyone who wants to make the sky fall. But yet we can't afford shuttles anymore. People throw millions of dollars towards, towards these literal, the literal harebrained schemes. And yet, no, no space shuttle is too expensive. Ah, uh, wasn't low enough. I mean, honestly, that used, that used to piss off my father no end, because everybody, as he put it, everybody would have some million-dollar idea, some genius brain chart. But, you know, oh, if only they... If, oh, if only they could get the attention of investors and so forth, they could make all this money on this invention and live the rest of their lives having to... in luxury, having to do nothing. And of course, my father, who was not an unintelligent man, who understood how things work and operated and functioned in a mechanical sense, made the point to them, like, okay, so what's this brilliant idea? And he pointed out that probably 99 times out of 100, it would never work in the first place because it was just stupid. It was a dumb idea. And that's not, that's not necessarily unexpected. True, there have been plenty of great inventions made by people who weren't necessarily experienced in a field, but it's important to consider the context of that, but those occasions are not the rule, they're the exception. There are hundreds of people, thousands, however many, who come up with stuff that doesn't work, it was never going to work, is never going to work, it just is not good.
And of course, a bunch of these guys' the hair brain schemes are perpetual now. motion machines. Infinite power! Yeah, except, uh, you know, physics has a lot to say about that. I mean, zero point energy has a greater probability of useful power output. Rosamia unit launching! That's like, yeah, you just put these magnets, you know, around the thing. And I love the fact that a lot the of these enemy. perpetual motion machines, you have to put power into them. And then they basically spin from the power that's applied and produce energy. And it's like, see, it's creating power. And it's like, well, yes, but the problem is entropy is in effect. In an ideal universe, it's not actually producing power. It's you're converting electrical energy into motion and then back into electrical energy. At best, you get out of it exactly what you put into it. But realistically, because of entropy, energy is lost as heat and electromagnetic radiation. You're getting out less than you put in. But again, this ties into that, that extraordinarily conspiratorial notion that, like, oh, well, the logical question is, if technology like this was A, possible, and B, so easy, why isn't it already happening? Why aren't we all doing it? It's like, oh, because it's some grand conspiracy by big oil to suppress the technology so that they can continue profiting off of burning non-renewable resources and so forth and so on. And that's that's why. It's all just a big lie, and it, it always worked all along. It's like, yes, but math. Math proves that the whole thing is bullshit from the start. Two plus two does not equal five. But that is what they anticipate to happen. They're adding two to a two and they're expecting to get five or maybe six out of it. It doesn't work that way. I mean, I've often, I've often considered that would there be a way for us to extract energy from the atomic or subatomic magnetism of a particle? Because, part of, you know, atoms exert this energy. If we could find a way to, to channel that energy in some usable fashion, we could use the sort of passive EM radiation of the atom as a power source. Now, there are... thing is, I came up with that when I was, like, 12? And I now understand the reason that that doesn't work is because power comes from a concentration of energy that is asymmetric between two sources. The problem is, you're trying to extract, you know, atomic magnetic energy in a universe where full of atoms which all have roughly the same atomic magnetic energy. What you're talking about is basically anti-entropy. A force which actually reduces the thermodynamic chaos of the universe. Which, in and of itself, if you could invent that, would be incredible. But barring maybe dark matter, dark energy, or a black hole, that's not fucking happening! And I understand that now, because I'm not fucking 12 anymore! I mean, my father claimed at one point that he had gotten, like, a perpetual motion machine working, which was basically an array of resisting magnets that, you know, would spin continuously. The thing, however, is that he pointed out, and here's the, the point where the story fell apart for me upon mature reflection later in life, that it only spun if you manually got it up to speed. And it would always run down. He didn't create a source of infinite power, he created a fucking magnetic flywheel. You spin it up, the energy you apply to it gets stored, but bleeds off because of friction, which is reduced by the magnets, and then it eventually stops spinning, because the only power it had was what you put into it. It's, unless we can somehow change the fundamentals of how the universe functions, like I said, black holes, exotic matter, alternate universe, some weird shit, you're not getting perpetual energy, drop it. Just drop it. It's not gonna happen. I'll kill anyone who wants to make the sky fall.
I mean, what we should be doing is focusing on practical energy sources like fusion power or, Where's the enemy? you know, natural energy sources. Go full on Gundam 00 and build a solar power array in order to plant it. That would solve a lot of problems. But no, let, let's put a bunch of magnets on a wheel and, and it's perpetual energy. Fucking <laughs> god damn it. Oh, oh. Here's my point. I'm not advocating the notion of leave it to the experts, because that that discourages learning and cross-specialization, and I ain't about that. What I am encouraging is that if you're going to attempt something, learn about it first. Learn what other people have done. Learn what has been tried, what worked, what maybe sort of worked but had problems. You know, it's not as simple as I can apply my layman's knowledge here, and that will give me some unique benefit that the experts don't have with their years of study and expertise, but I'll be able to solve a problem they didn't. I mean, it's, it's literally like the gambler's logic of only one in every a thousand wins, but maybe I'll be the one. It's like... <laughs> oh, God. I have to avoid talking about people doing stupid shit because it inevitably turns into a rant with me. Because in life, I I encounter too much of it, like just people doing stupid shit. People not thinking. They they act. They sleepwalk through life. I won't let you bring the sky down. And the argument, the counter-argument, is that, well, so what, they're, you know, minimally exceptional in terms of their intellect. I mean, it's not like they're hurting anybody, just leave it alone. However, scientists actually took a crack at that opinion and discovered that perhaps the most hazardous and possibly destructive human force on the planet are those who habit or frequent stupid actions or thought processes. And that's the thing, I'm not- I'm not even referencing, I'm not even talking about those who have, uh, mental disorder. That's not even my point. These are perfectly neurotypical individuals who just, either by their upbringing or some genetic quirk, don't think. They don't rationalize, they don't f Uh, they- again, they- I cannot think of a better way of- of describing it than to say that they sleepwalk through life. The shutters are closed, the they're just ambling about. I mean, there's a reason why zombie fiction is such a popular thing, and it's because it's easy to see the behavior of the sort of general masses as often drifting into that kind of brainless horde territory. Yeah, when George Carlin, um, did a show in the sort of post, um, the, the sort of post-terrorism uh, world, he made the point that, like, that's our, that's our latest mindless cliché, go out and buy some jewelry and a new car, otherwise the terrorists win. And, and that's the whole point is that, like, oh, this is an attack on our way of life. And therefore, to prove that it was not effective to ourselves, because it's not like the ones who pr conducted the attack give a shit, we need to go out and continue to be ruthlessly and relentlessly capitalistic to prove that, that it hasn't affected us. All the while completely missing the message of how did this attack occur in the first place? Why weren't there... why wasn't there better care taken to prevent it? What is our opposition actually after? By what means do they seek to achieve it? Know thy enemy. No, go out and buy some, go out and buy some jewelry and a new car, otherwise the terrorists win. I mean, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas actually referenced that when James Woods as, um... Oh, I forget his character's name, but he's like... He's like, oh, if it wasn't for what we do in this country, there would be, you know, hippie communes here, and, and everybody sharing. Nobody buying stuff.
You know, it is interesting that the term boomer gets applied to millennials all the fucking time, and Gen X, instead of the actual boomers, but yet terms like hippie have largely fallen out of modern parlance, despite the fact that the boomers were the hippies. <laughs> They were the they were the love the one you're with crowd. I mean, until they got older and became just say no. I mean, George Carlin broke down precisely why boomers are not well thought of in you know by the general population, and it's because of the complete and utter inversion of their ideological standpoint. I'm coming back now. I mean, it's true, they went from the better life through chemistry crowd to the just say no crowd. We had fun, so you don't get to. I mean, people don't get it why I don't like being called a boomer, because I'm not a boomer. And that, that's part of the reason why I, you know, shoot a leer over in the direction of... I'm not going to name names, but those who uh, provide that name for those to whom it does not qualify. I am not a boomer. <laughs>